we just give it um, another minute to start. Okay, we've reached two o'clock. Um, I'd like to welcome you to um, Rocky World's discussion for September. We're really excited to have you here um, for another exciting talk, kind of bringing together um, people interested in Earth, solar system, and exoplanets, and um, from a rocky, rocky world's rocky planet perspective. And I'm absolutely delighted to have Angie Pieta here from the Carnegie Earth and the Planets Laboratory, who's going to talk to us about rocky planets or water worlds. Um, and trying to understand the observability of these low denser lava worlds to see if we can distinguish between those scenarios, I imagine. Um, and so Angie's going to talk to us for about 30, 40 minutes, um, following which we're going to move to a more of a plenum discussion. So I'd really encourage you to think about um, interesting questions that you would like to kind of um, open to the community and to Angie specifically after the talk. Um, and we'll try and aim to be finished by three o'clock. Um, and just a reminder of kind of some etiquette that you prefer using your full names from. Zoom and that you keep muted throughout the talk. And if you're going to ask questions and join in the discussion, please do use your videos. Um, and so with that, I'll let Angeli start us off. Thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Amy. Yeah, and thank you for having me. Let's see, I'm going to share my slides. Okay, is that showing up? Yeah, looking super. Right, I'm going to Okay, move the little Zoom window. Okay, yeah, so thank you so much for having me here. Um, I think this is a really nice forum and I'm really excited to discuss with you all at the end as well. So um, as Amy said, I'm going to be talking about the atmospheric observability of low density lava worlds. And I'm going to motivate that first of all by talking about the sub-Neptune population as a whole. Um, so I always like to, to show this figure because we can see so clearly that the sub-Neptunes uh, between the sizes of Earth and Neptune are the most common type of exoplanet that have been discovered so far, even though we don't have one in the solar system. And that of course raises so many questions about how they form and evolve and what they're made from. Uh, and of course there's been a lot of amazing work already to try and answer some of these questions uh, with one of the the really key results coming from that, that the size distribution of these sub-Neptunes is bimodal. Uh, and so we have this peak at around 1.3 Earth radii that I'm going to refer to as super Earths, and this other peak at around 2.4 Earth radii, which I'm going to refer to as mini Neptunes. And the really interesting thing about this bimodality is that it exists not only in the dimension of radius, as I've shown here, uh, but also in the dimensionality of orbital period, where the slightly larger uh, mini Neptunes tend to be a little bit further away from their host stars, and the slightly uh, smaller super Earths tend to be closer to their host stars. And so there have been many uh, really excellent theories uh, ex explaining how the formation and evolution of these planets could lead to this particular distribution, including notably atmospheric loss, um, essentially that the mini Neptunes, because they are cooler and further away from their star, should be able to hold on to primordial hydrogen, whereas the super Earths being close to their host stars may have lost that primordial hydrogen. There are also other theories like uh, super Earths forming in a gas port environment. Um, but overall, this is really starting to give us a picture of uh, how these planets form and evolve. But now I want to throw a spanner in the works uh, and add uh, an extra dimension, which has been uh, a very, uh, you know, caused a lot of interest recently, uh, which is mass. And so uh, here I'm showing the uh, masses and radii of several known sub Neptunes. Those are the points here. And just for reference, um, I'm also showing these mass radius curves for a few constant compositions. So the gray is showing uh, an Earth-like composition, the purple is showing 100% silicate composition, and the blue dashed line is for 100% H2O composition. This one is dashed because it's very temperature dependent. So here I'm showing it for around 300 Kelvin, but this would of course be, be hard higher and have larger radii for hotter temperatures as well. Um, which is the case for some of these targets. So uh, I always love 
this mass radius diagram because it starts to tell us a little bit more about the bulk compositions of sub-Neptunes, uh, and it also raises a lot of new questions as well. So uh, we know that these planets that are uh, larger than what you would expect for 100% H2O composition must have a hydrogen atmosphere or hydrogen-rich atmosphere to explain these really low bulk densities. And of course, things that are more dense than an Earth-like composition need a denser component like iron enrichment, for example. But in this intermediate density region, which I've highlighted in blue, we have uh, a few different possibilities which can uh, explain these masses and radii. Uh, so for some of the cooler ones, um, it is possible that uh, a thin hydrogen rich atmosphere could be causing these intermediate bulk densities. Uh, for some of these planets, especially the ones close to the 100% silicate curve, it could be a case of uh, a depletion of iron or a lack of an iron core, um, or indeed a, a very volatile rich iron core, for example, uh, with an abundance of hydrogen in, in the iron core. Uh, but another very uh, tantalizing uh, possibility is of volatile rich mantles, uh, sometimes called water worlds. Uh, and there's been some growing evidence that these water worlds could exist among the sub-Neptune population. And so a question that I would love to answer, and I think a lot of people here uh, are probably interested in, is how do we distinguish these different scenarios? And how can we really try to get a little bit more compositional information uh, about these sub-Neptunes? I think ultimately this has to be a, a multi-pronged approach, but one way that we can start to probe this is using really extreme targets in the sub-Neptune population. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to be talking about uh, super-Earths that are very close to their host stars and that have day-side temperatures exceeding the melting point of silicates. Um, I'm going to be specifically focusing on day-side temperatures uh, roughly 2000 Kelvin and higher. And the aim here is that these really ultra heated planets uh, are going to have molten surfaces on the day side. And so whatever composition you have on that day side at the surface should be evaporating into the atmosphere. And while our atmospheric observations can't drill into the interior of the planet, we can try to measure the composition of the atmosphere. And so for these particular targets, that atmospheric composition is a little bit more directly linked uh, to the surface composition and can tell us whether we only have uh, a silicate composition at the surface that's evaporating, or if we have volatiles within the surface mixed in with uh, the silicates, then we could have both rock vapor and volatiles in this evaporating uh, atmosphere. So uh, luckily, unlike that, that figure from before, we don't need a giant blowtorch to heat up a bunch of super Earths because we have a few naturally occurring uh, lava worlds within the population. And so we know of several of these super Earths within the intermediate uh, density regime here, shaded in blue, that have uh, substellar temperatures on their day sides that are exceeding 2000 Kelvin, uh, or roughly 2000 Kelvin, and I've labeled some of those here. And so the question that I would like to uh, begin to answer is, do these particular low density lava worlds have volatile rich mantles? Um, can we try to detect volatiles trapped in the surface, or not necessarily trapped, <laughs> uh, volatiles in the surface evaporating into the atmosphere, which would tell us that these planets can form uh, with volatile rich mantles. So before I dive into that, I just wanted to do a quick recap of uh, how we can observe these atmospheres because I'll be coming back to this a little bit later on. So uh, probably the most common method for observing atmospheres is transmission spectroscopy, which uh, I've labeled here in purple. So this is where we see uh, stellar light filtered through uh, the limb of the atmosphere. Um, but for lava worlds, uh, given that many of them are expected to be tidally locked, it's possible that their atmospheres could just exist on the day side. It's not necessarily a global atmosphere. Um, and these are also uh, challenging planets to observe because they are so small. And so a really promising uh, technique to observe these atmospheres is secondary eclipse spectroscopy, uh, which has been used extensively as well for larger planets uh, and other rocky planets. And so with this technique, uh, we're able to observe the actual thermal emission coming from the planet itself. So we look at star plus the day side of the planet, and then during the eclipse, we see only the star and that difference tells us the thermal emission from the planet. And this is uh, the type of observation that I'll be focusing on uh, in the rest of this talk. Uh, 
So going back to these low density lava worlds, I wanted to briefly touch on a couple of different ways that we could have uh, volatiles mixed into these uh, mantles. So one possibility, of course, which I haven't shown here, is that we could have a rocky mantle with uh, a water layer on top. Um, but in some of these very hot cases, uh, another possibility is that uh, volatiles such as water could be dissolved in a magma ocean uh, or even in a solid rocky mantle, in which case the amount of volatiles that we are fitting into this mantle will be limited by uh, their solubility. And here on the right, another possibility is that because these lava worlds are reaching extreme temperatures, even going up to 3000 Kelvin, uh, there are some cases where we could achieve uh, ice rock or water rock miscibility uh, in parts of the mantle, in which case that's a, a way of adding even more volatiles into the rocky mantle. But whatever the way in which volatiles exist uh, in, in these planets, the idea here is that if we have a mixed surface composi composition, including both rock material and volatiles, given the very high irradiation that these lava worlds are receiving, both the rocky component and the volatile component should be able to evaporate into the atmosphere. And then with uh, secondary eclipse observations, we can try to measure that composition in the atmosphere and see whether we have uh, only rock vapor or uh, also volatiles in there as well. And so specifically, the questions that I'd like to focus on in, in the context of these mixed composition atmospheres is, first of all, what is the resulting chem chemical composition that we get uh, when we combine rock vapor and volatiles? And what is the opacity structure of that atmosphere? Secondly, what are the thermal structures of these atmospheres? Um, how do, does temperature vary with altitude? And finally, are these volatile species detectable with telescopes like JWST? And you might be thinking, well, I only really care about the last question. This is what we all want to know. Should we go and observe these planets and, and detect these volatiles? But I want to convince you that actually the first two questions relating to the composition, the opacity, and the temperature structure are actually really central to understanding whether these species are actually observable with, uh, with atmospheric observations. And so to, to demonstrate that, I'm going to use this figure, which is actually for, for a hot Jupiter, um, but it illustrates the, the same point. And so um, here on the right, this figure is showing the temperature profile of this model atmosphere. So we have here, pressure is increasing as you go down, um, um, and we have temperature on the x-axis. So here there are three different temperature profiles. The red one has a thermal inversion, so it gets hotter as you go to higher altitudes. Uh, the gray one is completely isothermal and the blue one uh, is non-inverted, so it gets cooler as you go up in altitude. And the reason for these different uh, temperature profiles comes down to the opacity of the atmosphere. So we get thermal inversions uh, when the optical and UV opacity in the atmosphere is very strong compared to the infrared opacity. This is something that we see on Earth. Uh, in that case, uh, ozone is the source of this a uh, short wavelength opacity that creates a thermal inversion, um, but other species can do it in, in exoplanets as well. Uh, whereas, you know, if the infrared opacity is really dominating in the atmosphere, then we get a non-inverted temperature profile. And so the reason this is important is that it affects the spectrum that we can observe for that atmosphere. So on the left, this is an example of some emission spectra um, with wavelength on, on the x-axis. And so for the, the red temperature profile with a thermal inversion, we're seeing thermal emission features, which come up as bumps in the spectrum. Whereas for the non-inverted temperature profile, we get almost a mirror image with uh, these troughs uh, for absorption features. And in the isothermal case, that's this gray spectrum, which you can see uh, is just a black body spectrum. It doesn't have any features. And so if we want to know whether volatile species are detectable in the atmospheres of low density lava worlds, it's really important to understand what the temperature profile is doing because we could have a case where the, the spectrum is just featureless. Uh, and ideally we want to target cases where there is a chance of detecting either emission features or absorption features. But of course the key uh, to determining this temperature profile is opacity, as I mentioned. So I just wanna give you a, a little look at the opacity sources that we can expect in these lava world atmospheres. I'm gonna start off with um, 
the case of a purely rock vapor atmosphere. So here I'm showing uh, the absorption cross sections of different chemical species weighted by the abundances of those species that we would expect with uh, chemical equilibrium. And on the x-axis here is, is wavelength. And so we can see that for a purely rock vapor atmosphere, we have very strong UV and optical opacity here at less than one micron, including uh, contributions from SIO, MGO, iron, sodium, potassium, TIO, things like that. Um, in, the in, in, in the infrared, there is also some contribution, but it's a, a little bit lowered. Now, if I add to 50% you know, rock vapor and 50% volatiles, where here the volatiles consist of water and CO2, then you can see that the infrared opacity suddenly jumps up uh, and we have contributions, especially from, uh, from H2O, which has some nice uh, continuum opacity throughout the infrared. And then if I increase the volatiles again to 99% and only 1% rock vapor, then uh, the infrared opacity begins to dominate over the UV and optical. Um, and so this is going to inform the temperature profiles that we're going to get uh, for our lab, lab worlds. So um, before I go into the more detailed models, um, I just wanted to explain the different cases that uh, I'm going to be modeling. And in particular, there are many different factors that will affect the relative abundances of rock vapor versus volatiles in the atmosphere. And I'm not going to answer these questions. Uh, these are actually questions that hopefully we can discuss uh, at the end of this. But um, for example, uh, it's useful to know what is the rate of atmospheric escape in these planets? How does that escape rate uh, vary for different chemical species? Um, how are different phases partitioned between the atmosphere and interior? And indeed, how, uh, how are things partitioned within the interior? And how quickly can we replenish surface material once it evaporates? These are all questions which will ultimately affect the composition of the atmosphere. Um, but for simplicity in this work, I'm going to marginalize over all of these factors and simply model a, a range of compositions in the atmosphere. And specifically, I'm going to look at uh, two axes of composition. Uh, one is the ratio of the rock vapor to volatiles. So going from 100% rock vapor all the way to 1% rock vapor with 99% volatiles. And the other dimension is the actual composition of these volatiles. So um, one scenario I'm considering is a purely water scenario um, where those volatiles that I'm adding is just, just H2O. Uh, then I'm also considering a case where we could also have some carbon in there as well with a mixture of H2O and CO2. And finally, uh, I'm also going to consider a, a desiccated scenario, where, which is similar to the H2O plus CO2, but assuming that we're losing the hydrogen uh, due to atmospheric escape, leaving behind only O2 and CO2. And these volatile compositions are, are really informing the elemental uh, abundances of volatiles going into the model. Um, so here we start off with a certain volatile composition to which we add uh, the rock vapor composition. This is calculated using the vapor rock code, assuming a bulk silicate earth composition for a given uh, pressure and temperature. And then uh, based on the elemental abundances from this mixture of volatiles and rock vapor, it then calculates equilibrium chemistry using fast chem, and, and that gives us the equilibrium chemical abundances of different species as a function of pressure in the atmosphere. Uh, combined with the opacities, the, the cross sections that I was showing before, we can then calculate the equilibrium temperature profile of the atmosphere, which is crucial, as we saw before, to calculate the emission spectrum of the atmosphere. So I'll be showing some of these emission spectra, um, but these are challenging uh, planets to observe because they're, they're very small. And so uh, going beyond just the model spectra, I'm also going to show you some simulated observations to give an idea of what's realistic to observe, uh, what, what are the features that we can pick out with real observations. And I'm also going to show very briefly some inverse modeling uh, that allows us to test how significant those detections could be. So in particular, I'm going to focus on three case studies uh, that span a bit of a range in temperature. So the hottest case is 55 Cancri E, approaching almost 3000 Kelvin at the substellar point. Uh, the medium case is HD3167B at around 2500 Kelvin. And the third one, the coolest one, is HD86226C uh, at about 1900 Kelvin at the substellar point. And I'm going to show uh, a few examples uh, of the results just to, to show the key points. <clears throat> 
in particular focusing on how the composition of the atmosphere and the temperature of the atmosphere affects uh, its observability and, and the features in the emission spectrum. So first of all, uh, one trend that I, I want to highlight is the effect of just adding volatiles on top of the rock vapor. So in these figures that I'm going to show, um, the different colors correspond to different fractions of rock vapor. So the dark blue is showing a purely rock vapor atmosphere. And as you go to the lighter colors, that's adding more and more volatiles. Have the temperature profile here on the left and the emission spectra of the corresponding to those temperature profiles on the right. So we can see that, uh, as expected, the purely rocky, uh, pure rock vapor atmosphere is showing a thermal inversion because of all that strong UV and optical opacity. And that results actually in some emission features from SiO and SiO2, which you can see um, over here where the my cursor is. Uh, but then as we start to add volatiles very quickly, the temperature profile switches from being inverted to being non-inverted. Uh, and we start to see that in the spectrum in the form of absorption features. So here we're seeing absorption features due to CO2 uh, and also H2O, and they get stronger and stronger as we add uh, more volatiles. So something interesting to note is that in this particular figure, this is uh, the case where the volatiles consist of both water and CO2. And actually the water opacity in the infrared is so strong that it really washes out any opacity from SiO and SiO2. So even though we have this uh, silicate uh, feature from the purely rock vapor atmosphere, it's completely washed out as soon as we add even just 10% of volatiles in the atmosphere because water is present. Now, uh, what about uh, the volatile composition where we don't have water, where we only have O2 and CO2 added? Uh, the difference here is that water was such a strong source of uh, opacity in the infrared, that even though CO2 has a lot of opacity in the infrared as well, it's not quite as much. So I'm finding that you need uh, a higher fraction of volatiles in the atmosphere to switch from having a thermally inverted temperature profile to a non-inverted profile. So actually here, um, the cases with up to even 50% uh, of volatiles have slightly thermally inverted uh, temperature profiles and show these uh, emission features. But then once again, once we add more than 50% volatiles, then we go back to having these absorption features. Uh, the other thing to note is that because there is no, there's no hydrogen, there's no uh, water in this uh, atmosphere, uh, there is no water opacity to wash out the SiO and SiO2 features, and those remain in the spectrum, uh, first as, as emission features and then as absorption features once we add more volatiles. So uh, now we can also look at the effect uh, of temperature uh, on these emission spectra. So on the left, I'm showing the case of HD3167b at around 2500 Kelvin. And here at this temperature, around 10% of volatiles is enough to start producing absorption features in the spectrum. So immediately once you add a few volatiles, uh, you switch from a thermal inversion to a thermally non-inverted temperature profile. But here on the right, I'm showing the case of the 55 Cancri E, which is a little bit hotter. And in this scenario, um, actually a lot of the water is thermally dissociated in the atmosphere, which means that for a particular fraction of volatiles in the atmosphere, you have less uh, infrared opacity than you would for a slightly cooler case. And that means that you need a higher fraction of volatiles to flip over uh, the thermal, the temperature profile from being inverted to non-inverted. So compared to this 10% of volatiles, needed to produce absorption features. For 55 Cancri E, you need sort of 70 to 90% uh, of volatiles to start getting absorption features. So that means that potentially, uh, if we want to specifically look for volatiles targeting slightly cooler, by cooler I mean still <laughs> above 2000 Kelvin, but uh, slightly cooler uh, targets. Uh, but at the same time, if we do detect uh, volatile absorption features in a pan as hot as 55 Cancri E, that means that uh, there's quite a significant fraction of volatiles in that atmosphere, which would also be very interesting. So the next question now is, are these volatiles actually detectable with JWST? Um, those of you who are eagle-eyed may have noticed some little uh, yellow data points in the previous plots, and I'm going to start focusing on that more now. So uh, going from these uh, model emission spectra, uh, I'm going to show you some simulated observations uh, for JWST, which are calculated using Pandexo. 
Uh, and then from these simulated observations, I'm going to test whether if we really observed that, would we be able to do inverse modeling on those observations and statistically detect uh, volatile uh, features in the spectrum <clears throat> or would the signal to noise be too low? I'm going to use that doing uh, atmospheric retrievals or atmospheric inverse modeling. Um, and this method allows us to calculate detection significances of different species in the observed spectrum. And so I'm going to show you how much observing time you need to significantly detect water and CO2 in these uh, atmospheres. So I'm going to start off with the case of 55 Cancri E. And as we saw before, the more volatiles you add, the stronger the features are. So here I'm going to show you a nice and optimistic case with 99% volatiles, which have a, a nice deep feature. And so 55 Cancri E uh, is actually being observed from cycle one of JWST. Uh, I know that some of these observations have already been taken, uh, which is really exciting. And I'm looking forward to seeing the final version of that and, and what they show. So there are observations both with NIRCAM uh, in the four to five micron range. So this is probing this nice CO2 feature here on the left. And there are also MIRI LRS observations in the five to 12 micron range, um, which I'm showing here sort of on the right. And so these observations I'm showing here are purely simulated. These aren't the real, the real deal. Um, but I can see that given the model spectra, uh, assuming 99% volatiles, the amount of observing time that has already been assigned to this target is more than enough to very nicely detect the CO2 feature and even to, uh, to start to detect the, the H2O in the MIRI LRS range as well, even though the CO2 feature is a, a lot more prominent than, than the H2O. And so this is great. If these volatiles are really abundant in the atmosphere of 55 Cangri E, uh, we have some good chances of detecting those with the observations from cycle one. So next I'm going to show you the case uh, of HD3167B and actually the, the third and the coolest target HD86226C uh, has very similar observability. So I'm going to, to combine these two together. So uh, these targets um, using uh, simulating data for a different observing mode with JWST. This time I'm assuming uh, five eclipses with a near spec. The reason for this is that uh, near spec has a very uh, useful wavelength range. Uh, it covers both water and CO2 features. Uh, and it's, we're able to use near-spec with these targets, whereas for 55 Cancri E, near-spec would have been saturated. So I'm finding here that with five secondary eclipses, which is a, a reasonable amount of observing time, we would be able to detect both water and CO2 with statistical significance, so at least three sigma, for both of these uh, targets. Um, so that's very promising, and it means that it's, it's worth going out to observe these targets to try and detect these uh, volatile features. Okay, so I think I'm right on time, more or less, hopefully. Um, and so just to summarize quickly, uh, we can start to test for the presence of volatile rich mantles among the super earth population by looking specifically for volatile species in the atmospheres of low density lava worlds, where the presence of volatiles means that those volatiles are evaporating from uh, the mantle itself. Um, the detectability of these volatile features does depend on the composition of the atmosphere and the temperature of the atmosphere, because uh, in these emission observations, the sizes uh, of these features are really dependent and very sensitive to the, the exact temperature profile and the opacity of the atmosphere. But despite that, uh, I'm finding that several of these uh, volatile features like water and CO2 are detectable in many cases. Uh, and for some uh, very advantageous targets that, that I was showing it, with a very reasonable amount of JWST uh, observing time as well. Uh, so we'll actually be testing this in cycle two as well, uh, there's a program led by Johanna Teske for TY561B, which is another low density lava world. Uh, so I'm very excited to see what the observations show for that as well. Um, but yeah, otherwise I look forward to discussing with you some of those other questions uh, that, that I raised before. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Angelique, that was a super talk. That was really exciting. I'm, I'm very happy now to open the floor um, to questions if anyone's got. Any immediate thoughts? Um, and me. Oh, Carolyn, let's jump in, go for it. Hi, hi, Anjali. Thank you for this very nice talk. Uh, and I'm, my question is like, how do these, um, uh, how do these spectra depend on the the total atmospheric pressure, like the this your surface pressure? Um, 
uh, of a surface pressure can you have to still see these features? Mm, yeah, great question. So uh, in the cases with the volatiles, I've actually in, in all of these cases, I've assumed that the atmosphere is optically thick, which uh, given the opacities in these atmospheres, you know, means typically around 0.1 bar, roughly, uh, depending on the case. So already that's not a, a super thick atmosphere and that's enough to get these features. If the atmosphere was less thick than what I'm assuming here, uh, I think you could still see uh, features. And actually then a, another effect can come in where if you have a, a very optically thin atmosphere, you could get thermal decoupling between the atmosphere and the surface. And that additional uh, temperature gap can uh, create even stronger features. Um, it, it, it could go either way, depending on the nature of that temperature gap, but you could get uh, very strong emission features or absorption features, which then depend on the energy redistribution. <laughs> so, <coughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, there's a, a very interesting paper by uh, Zhang Nguyen on, on this for purely rocky lava worlds, um, where depending on the nature of uh, redu energy redistribution in the atmosphere, the surface could be hotter or colder than the atmosphere, resulting in emission features or absorption features only from the temperature gap between the atmosphere and the surface. So that would be uh, the case in the optically thin scenario and the size of those features would depend then on the level of, of energy redistribution and, and probably other things as well. Cool, thanks so much, yeah. Yeah, I think um, Claire's got another question if you can switch the video on Claire. Do you have a question, Claire, that you want to ask? Okay, well, well, Claire's kind of resorting her internet or whatever's going on. Um, can I ask a question, actually? Um, I was just wondering about, um, do you think that, this might be a horrible question, but do you think that these hot star, hot planets, really represent the same kind of planets as the cooler ones in terms of the formation mechanism. I know the density maybe is the same and they sit in that same bit of parameter space, but do you really think they are the same planets? I think that's a great question. Yeah, it is going to be a slightly different population, even from uh, the level of stellar type, right? Uh, from, you know, the, the Luke and Pi paper recently showing the, the M dwarf sort of intermediate density planets uh, and water worlds. You know, those are MDORs, these lava worlds are necessarily orbiting more sun-like stars because that's the only way to get that hot. And so already that is a slightly different population. I think what it can tell us, though, is whether it's even possible to form uh, a planet with a large fraction of volatiles. And so like I was I'm mentioning before, I think we really need this multi-pronged approach where this could be one way of just showing quite directly that it's possible to accrete these uh, volatiles during the formation of the planet uh, and then whether that happens in the same way for other populations i think we would need other lines of evidence um as well so uh, lots of pieces of the puzzle oh thank you that's a nice answer um claire if you want to write down the question in the chat we can read it out um i think ollie has got a question next hey yeah i had a really boring question so i'm sorry for my boring question but it's just about the the opacity data is um do how well do we know that for all the species we might care to know it for and at the conditions we find them in in these these planets great question yeah so i mean exomol has been doing a great job of of getting these opacities to, to really high temperatures so some of these for example sio has a, a very recent line list uh, which is in a, the right temperature range for these cases but there are some species uh, for example feo is one that that currently i'm not aware of any line list that's available the way that i chose the species that i included or you know looked for the the opacities of the relevant species was to see what are the most abundant species given chemical equilibrium and so most of them uh, seem to be available, but there are the odd ones like feo which uh, it would be great to to add to that catalog uh, in the future then there are also other unknowns. Uh, a big one is broadening, although for, for these love worlds, uh, it's pressure broadening specifically. For these love worlds, because the atmospheric pressures are, are very low, um, or at least the photosphere is at very low pressures, I don't think that should have a huge effect uh, on what we're observing. Uh, but that is a source of uncertainty in the sense that if you have a, a sodium background in your atmosphere, we don't have sodium broadened 
cross sections or anything. Um, so that in theory could could uh, affect that. But I think uh, in terms of big picture, we're doing fairly well. But uh, yeah, there are there are always unknowns. And as we get to sort of thicker atmospheres, uh, that pressure broadening will become more important. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Anjali. Um, Claire's questions just come through now, and she was wondering if detecting water features would indicate a magma ocean near water saturation, given the work from the MO community showing very high solubility of water in pyrodite melt, or would there likely be other ways of making a water-rich atmosphere? I I think that, I mean, I, possibly other people in this audience might know better than me, but um, I could imagine that there could be multiple ways uh, of getting that. I think, yeah, this, this high solubility of water would be a very compelling way to get that steam atmosphere. Um, for some of the really extreme cases, I'm really excited about the, the work that has been done on water rock miscibility. Um, you know, if it was like 3000 Kelvin uh, sort of regime. Um, so that could be uh, another interesting possibility. Um, yeah, I, I, I think absolutely, yeah, that, that is definitely a, a very compelling way to get a steam atmosphere. Thank you. Um, Seth Jacobson's got a question now. Are you there, Seth? Would you like to ask it yourself? Sure. I put it in the chat because I didn't want to forget it. So the, um, you know, you, in your talk, you showed this 80% uh, mixing ratio for water and then a 0% fully desiccated. But do you have a sense of, of just how much water is needed to change the spectra? So um, the... Do you mean in terms of like water versus CO2 rather than yeah, water? Versus, exactly. uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, water um, versus CO2, exactly. Yeah, actually, so the it doesn't make the a huge difference. I think the I didn't calculate the threshold abundance that you would need, but actually um, in many of these uh, features, you know, there is some overlap between CO2 and water, but also regions where they're separate. And I think there's a point where, you know, if you have close to fit, we see several tens of percent of each, then uh, the features can actually saturate. And so it doesn't make a huge difference to the size of the feature. If you went down to you know, a much smaller percentage of water relative to CO2, then that would start to affect the feature. I don't know the exact threshold where that would happen. Um, but what about it, the silica feature? That as well. So actually with all of these cases, uh, partly because this, is in emission spectroscopy uh, and partly because of the signal to noise of, of the observations that are feasible, it's very difficult to constrain abundances of these different uh, species. So I think uh, from relative sizes of different features, it might be possible to start to get ratios. Um, I haven't quantified that yet, but it is quite challenging. So even um, with uh, the cases we have, you know, mixed volatiles and silicates, determining exactly what the ratio of the volatile versus silicates component is. It, if, if you use self-consistent models like the ones that I've shown, then uh, yes, that will depend on the temperature profile you get because of the different opacity sources. But if you do it in a more data-driven way, uh, like with the inverse modeling that I, I only briefly touched on, uh, then there is a lot of degeneracy between the different abundances of the species and the temperature gradient in the atmosphere. So that's kind of a long-winded way of saying that for example, uh, what we're doing with hot Jupiters, there you can get these really precise nice abundances. For these planets, that's a lot more challenging. And I think uh, a very feasible goal is to detect the presence of some of these species, but the abundances specifically are gonna be a bit more challenging. Um, but, but when it comes to the ratios of different species, I think that's uh, an interesting route to go down. That's something actually I'd like to look more into. Hopefully I, I answered your question. So if I didn't, feel free to, to ask again. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds Thank like you. we're going to push forward in the future with better observations. Um, yes. Raphael, you've got a question as well. Hi, apologies, I don't have a webcam connected. Uh, thank you, Anjali, for the talk. It was great. Uh, and yeah, my question is, you have been simulated the, the detectability with James Webb, but what are the prospects for these targets in high resolution? Uh, because they orbit very bright holes. I think there is something that can be done from ground uh, with these targets that are hopping off and emission has proven to be very successful in cross-correlation to do uh, atmospheric studies also. So what is your take on this? 
I'm really excited about the prospect of doing these plants with high res. Um, so I'm actually working on this with some collaborators who, who focus more on the high resolution. It's work in progress at the moment, uh, but I'm really hopeful that that we can do something there because, you know, for example, something like water, it has so many lines that, you know, with JWST, we're looking for these subtle features, but if we could uh, do that at high res, I think if the signal is enough, that could be a really compelling uh, detection and certainly very complementary with, with JWST. Um, these are difficult targets to observe. So I think the more ways we can do it and put those results together, the better. Uh, so yeah, I guess my answer is uh, watch this space. <laughs> and I'm very excited about that. Yeah, super. Um, there's a question from Priyanka Shkosh. Are you there? Priyanka Shkosh, would you like to answer it? Ask it yourself. Um, if not, I'll read it out. Um, so he, they're asking how you distinguish between a hot planet, which is hot because it was newly formed, i.e. internal heat, and hot because it is very close to its host star. Mm, yeah, so the targets that I was showing just now, I'm determining that they're hot because of their uh, proximity to their host star. So I actually don't know uh, what the internal temperatures of these planets are. Uh, for I think for the internal temperature of the planet to affect the, uh, the observable spectrum, that internal temperature needs to be comparable to the amount of irradiation that the planet is getting. So these cases are so hot that you would need an internal temperature of like 2000, 3000 Kelvin, which I, I don't think is possible because we're entering a stellar regime there. Um, so for these particular targets, the irradiation is definitely more um, important than uh, the internal temperature. But that's a great point that there could be other targets out there that are further away from their stars that are lava worlds because of their age. Uh, the challenge there is, is I guess, uh, you know, it's going to be more rare to, to catch them at, at that early phase. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's why I'm targeting the ones that are actually close to their, their host stars so that we know they're receiving that irradiation. Super. Um, this question from Gopalan. Hi, uh, nice talk. Um, I had a simple question regarding the volatile species that you are considering, H2O and CO2. So I was wondering whether sulf oxides of sulfur and nitrogen would also be included if data were available, or is this because those species do not survive in the atmosphere of such planets? Mm, great question. So in this particular modeling, I haven't included sulfur and nitrogen just for simplicity, uh, but that is something that we could add to the models as well. Uh, in terms of surviving, um, I think, yeah, that's that's one of the questions that I'm interested in, not only for sulfur and nitrogen, but also for the, the oxygen and the carbon. Um, you know, how are these elements sort of volatile enough that they are escaping continuously and how does that affect the relative abundances of the volatiles and the silicates. Uh, so I think, yeah, that, that's a question that, that definitely applies to, to all of the volatile and to be honest, the, the rock vapor species as well. Um, so yeah, that could definitely be interesting to add more, more volatile elements. Thank you, thank you. Super, and any other questions? You've had a whole flurry of them, and everyone's very excited. Did anyone have any more generic questions about? the topic in general as well as actually specific yeah, great, Ollie. <laughs> so sorry to come sorry to come back with a question but i was wondering in the cases where you have the the thermal inversion well no not where you have them where it's getting cooler with altitude do we expect there to be condensation of phases within the atmosphere um and that condensation to affect the observability of um, or detectability of features and species in the yeah. atmosphere. In some cases, yes. Yeah. So if uh, especially the the cases where yeah, a lot of volatiles where you get cooler higher up, depending on how much radiation you're getting, there are some cases where you could start to condense the silicates high up in the atmosphere. Um, and so the cases that I've considered aren't quite reaching that point, maybe on on, on the boundary there. Uh, but there are some. Yeah, the cooler that you go, the more likely you are to to be able to get um, the silicate clouds. Um, which in turn could you know, not only remove the silicates from, from the atmosphere, but perhaps more likely the effect would be that the clouds could mask uh, some uh, part of the, of the spectrum. Um, because this is in thermal emission, um, it would depend on the nature of the clouds and uh, where they are optically thick, whether they're optically thick. So that doesn't necessarily mean that we wouldn't be able to uh, detect other, other features, but um, that would be interesting. The, the other cool thing if you had clouds is that if you can increase the albedo of the atmosphere, um, you know, if we were to detect 
of weirdly low temperature, that could be indicative of the presence of clouds, which would be interesting. Very cool. Um, I think um, Kopilans, another question. Yeah, hi, sorry. Uh, I just had this very simple question regarding the age of the star uh, that we are looking at. These planets, um, so are these stars in the main sequence stage or in their early evolutionary stage? Because that would also give an indication about the uh, stage at which the planet is. So do we have an understanding of that? For some of them, yes. Um, okay. So some of these targets are uh, pretty old. So for example, I mentioned that we have some observations coming up for TI 561b. That yeah. is you know, 10 gig years plus or minus a couple of gig years um, old, that system. So we know that it's old. The other interesting thing about the age is then that if we are, uh, you know, if we do detect volatiles in that atmosphere, then there must, whatever reservoir is, is allowed, you know, I'm guessing those volatiles must have survived for a pretty long time for the, the whole yes. evolution of that. So that's yeah. another sort of uh, interesting okay. dimension. But, but we don't know the ages very well for all of these targets. Some of them are, the, the age constraint just isn't great. Um, so we don't know whether, whether they're a bit younger uh, or older. So it depends on the target. Thank you. Thank you. Christian, you have a question? Oh, I, I can't I hear you. I We still can't hear you, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking. Okay, no problem. We'll read it out. So why um, do you have two to... questions? Why do you have pronounced error bars at higher wavelengths? I know, sorry, that's from someone else, but yeah, pronounce that. Okay, I'll, I'll start with the, the first question. So yeah, the, the error bars get longer, um, a higher wavelength, there's a thermal noise in uh, in the instrument. So especially the MIRI LRS, I, I imagine that's probably what you, you're referring to. Those error bars are larger uh, because you, you get more thermal noise. Um, so yeah, there's an interesting trade-off there where the the, sig the raw signal itself is higher at longer wavelengths, but it gets a little bit more challenging to observe. So, and also you want to observe a wavelength range where you, there are features that you're looking for. So there's an interesting trade-off there. Um, near spec is a, is a favorite of mine. <laughs> okay, um, and Christian's asking, do you know what kind of a kinetics or what the effect of kinetics could be on the spectrum? Oh, so, okay, I'm gonna assume, yeah, that means like chemical kinetics in the atmosphere. That would be really interesting. Um, I haven't considered that in detail. Um, there's also, yeah, the, the conditions are so extreme in these atmospheres that I think at the sort of super high altitudes we could start to get like non-LT effects as well. Um, so yeah, I'm sure that there are a lot of very interesting things that could happen. I haven't looked at them in, in detail yet. Chandan, who might have a question as well? Yeah, uh, thank you for the nice talk, Anjali. Uh, I just wanted uh, to ask a very simple question, like uh, when you're uh, talking about the exchange of gases in the volatiles, uh, especially it takes, uh, it also re results in the change in the composition of the surface. So what is the depth you are considering for the surface? And uh, uh, yeah, that, that's my primary question. Yeah, so um, a good question. So in this particular model, I've, I've simplified things a lot. And so what I'm doing is I'm, just assuming a particular ratio of the, the volatiles in the atmosphere to the silicates without directly linking it to what the composition is of the surface. And so this, this is actually a question that I, that I have for all of you, I suppose, um, is, you know, how do we start to relate that uh, more specifically if we were able to get uh, relative abundances of silicates uh, and volatiles in the atmosphere, what does that mean for the surface? Because also, you know, the, the volatile species presumably will, will evaporate more easily than uh, some of the more refractory species. And so that will be part of the effect. Um, and then also there's the atmospheric escape, but <laughs> that's getting further away from your question. And so, yeah, and, and then, you know, you were mentioning what's left in the surface. So the replenishment of material at the surface, for example, if you have a, a deep magma ocean that's convecting, uh, that would presumably change what is evaporating from the surface. So those are questions that, that I am not able to answer, but I 
I think that's a really important next step and uh, hopefully one that, that we can work on as a community. Okay, that has, uh, just to add on, like uh, when you're talking about low density or uh, uh, lava, then uh, how much uh, low density are you considering? Like, uh, and what are the typical uh, constituents of the lava you're taking? Like, do you have any composition or something? Yes. So for the composition of the magma ocean, I'm assuming bulk silicate earth. Uh, for that, that a rock vapor uh, component. Um, so Christian actually, who's who's here as well, um, has done some cool work. Uh, oh yeah, Christian and and uh, uh, also uh, their group uh, with Yumi and Miguel have done work on distinguishing different uh, types of composition at the surface. Uh, so I've just focused on one because the dominant effect in this work is the addition of volatiles, and the nature of the uh, rock vapor isn't as significant just because I'm. I'm adding a lot of volatiles. Um, and then, uh, oh yeah, the, the other question was, uh, what counts as low density? And so, yeah, in, in this particular case, I am considering um, uh, lava worlds that are less equally dense or less dense than 100% silicate composition on the mass radius diagram, uh, but that are more dense than 100% uh, H2O composition. Um, in this particular paper, I'm actually considering plants that are, yeah, a little bit closer towards 100% silicate curve. The reason for that is that there are basically different questions that we can try to answer with different regimes. And so for planets that are very close to the 100% silicate curve or on it, the question is, oh, is, does this even have additional volatiles or is it, you know, could it be just a ball of rock with like this depleted in iron? Is there something interesting going on with the core? Um, or is it a volatile rich mantle with, with this sort of volatile rich atmosphere? I think that's the sort of question to ask. Uh, and then for uh, the even lower density cases than that, where you really require an atmosphere to explain the low density, it doesn't have to be hydrogen, uh, but it could be. Then there are other questions of, well, how old is it? Could it have a little bit of hydrogen left because it's really young and it's still losing it? Um, or does it have just a, a really high water mass fraction? So I think there are, there are different questions that we can ask for those different regimes. Um, so yeah, the, I. I Touched on a couple of those in, in this particular paper, but I think there's uh, more to be done there as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It looks like you've got another question from Aurea. Yeah. Thank you, indeed. Uh, I had a question about the scale height of the atmosphere. If you had the uh, volatiles, maybe you will uh, be able to do, for example, transmission spectroscopy. Is it something you consider? Do you do just emission? So, so far I've just looked at the emission spectroscopy, but yeah, that's a great point that if we, uh, you know, if there are volatiles, then that opens up uh, the, these, these observations to, to transmission spectroscopy as well. I haven't uh, modeled the transmission spectrum yet, uh, but yeah, that, that is definitely something worth looking into. And I think if uh, transmission spectroscopy is possible for some of these targets, that would be a, a nice way to get a handle on some of the more precise abundances potentially, more so than uh, emission where the features tend to saturate. Uh, and the other interesting question, uh, going back to the previous question actually, for the slightly lower density cases where we know there's definitely an atmosphere. And I think the question is, oh, are the volatiles hydrogen or are they you know, something else like water? Then transmission, transmission spectroscopy would be great to try to distinguish like hydrogen from, from steam or something like that. Yeah, de definitely worth doing. Super, we've had lots of exciting questions. Everyone's very um, interested by your work, Angelique. It's perfect. Um, I think if there are um, no further pressing questions, we should probably wrap up now and allow them to finish what we finish on time. But thank you so much, Angelique, for a great talk. It was really exciting. Um, thank and, you, Amy. Thank you for the great questions as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we've got Rocky Words discussions next month on the 5th of October. Uh, 1, 1 p.m. UTC again, and that's from Resvan Carapus, who's going to be talking about the condensation of planets from proto-lunar proto disks after giant impacts. So I really encourage you all to join them. Thank you. Thank you again, Anjali. Thank you so much.